Bonjour à tous. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session on finances and economic uh, sovereignty. They say the word uh, sovereignty. There have been sessions on sovereignty, so digital or other. So to go with us in this session, I'm delighted to have on the other end is Nelly Liang, who is the Under Secretary for the U Interior Finance in the US. She also has a lot of experience because for three decades she was in the as governor where she was responsible for financial stability in these difficult periods, so we will be delighted to listen to her. Then, at a distance, Mr. Klaus, Klaus Reding, working for the, the European Mechanism for Stability from the European uh, Stability Fund. He has worked everywhere in Europe, in Asia, in the US, uh, in public and private sectors, at the, the Ministry of uh, Finance and others. I think that Europe can be reassured to know that he is in this position. Then we will listen to Delphine Damazit, who you may know a little better. She is the CEO of Euronext Paris after having been general deputy general manager of Orange Bank. That was her life in the private world beforehand. She was to work in the, uh, in the domestic uh, finance and uh, she has been was a counselor to a number of ministers. Then we'll listen to Kerstin Hatton, CEO of DNB Bank, uh, the first uh, major Norwegian institution, also president of VIPS. And what is VIPS? VIPS is the largest payment application by mobile phones in Norway. And so she will talk a bit uh, about the northern countries. Nordic countries, rather. A few words about uh, Philip uh, Brassap, uh, who is general manager of Crédit Agricole, uh, who knows this institution very well. He has had his whole uh, uh, career there. He also sees the CEO of LCL and also was responsible for the uh, agricultural credit bank. And we'll end with a, an economist, uh, someone who has published a lot, a professor of uh, international uh, politics economic politics in uh, Harvard University, wrote a, rule, a book on uh, the rules of uh, good and bad about uh, so a science which is going to be somewhat miserableist. So, so finance and sovereignty and economic sovereignty well, sovereignty is a concept which is mainly used with uh, sector aspect, but, uh, autonomous in terms of energy or digitally. And it, uh, economic sovereignty cannot be imagined without having a minimum sovereignty in terms of finance, because to get this uh, strategic sovereignty, the need for funding, you have heard enough, it's going to be massive, not to mention those for the climate transition. And there is another dimension of sovereignty linked to extraterritoriality of a country. And here we have finance, which at the same time becomes a dissuasive arm, not only to fight uh, laundering, but also which can be used against uh, anti-competition uh, practices or considered to be anti-competitive and also a strategic weapon. So I've seen which conditions we can get a strategic autonomy thanks to finance. The first condition 
is that we have no financial uh, power without economic power. So schematically, the issue concerns three economic areas, the United States, China, or the BRICS, 23% of uh, the global GDP, and Europe because they do not have the European countries taken one by one. So this condition is a prerequisite and an essential point in the financial sovereignty to have a currency which has an international status. First, now you have the dollar and the euro with a definite supremacy of the dollar. I won't give you figures, I have no time. So. Here we understand the impact of extraterritorial sanctions, for instance, the American ones, when it is impossible or almost to do without such a currency for your activity or even to do without the activity in a large economic area. That is the first condition. The second condition, and I have to sum up, concerns the capacity to mobilize savings and attract capital. As everyone knows, there are three ways of funding banks and uh, markets are not on the, the non-listed. Uh, Europe has large international banks, but uh, the 2008 crisis increased the bank union, banking union, even if it's not finished yet. The European markets uh, in debt and uh, equity have uh, handicaps compared with the United States. The debt markets, we know, are domestic and therefore fragmented, which reduces the attractiveness of the Eurozone. The sanitary crisis, I'd say, fortunately, sped up the obligations uh, for Europe, uh, the emissions of uh, bonds for Europe, but we are far from the figures uh, emitted by the countries themselves. Let's hope we will not need a new crisis to accelerate uh, the mutualization of some of the public debts, which will be essential to fund uh, the strategic autonomy. As for the stock exchanges, we also have a problem of fragmenting, and we can talk about it. And I'll end with a sentence on a fourth handicap that Europe, uh, which Europe suffers. It concerns infrastructure in the market, less mediatized than a technical loan, but still essential. So there's a definite supremacy of the Anglo-Saxons, similar to uh, the uh, supremacy of European individualism. In the United States, there's only one structure. In Europe, you have more than you have countries. More fragmentation again and again. Whereas, as Christine Lagarde said earlier, uh, what is it? The urgency is the capital markets. Unfortunately, to do that, there is a little lack of political will, and I will end on that. And so I will give the floor to Nelly Liang, who in her activities as Under Secretary for Domestic Finance is attached to an efficient uh, regulation for the number of uh, digital she also works on the digital uh, currency. Is this going to reinforce the role of a dollar as the central currency? Here, thank you, Catherine, for the uh, invitation to speak here to the conference organizers. Very happy to be here. I will be speaking in English. I wish I could speak your lovely language, French, but I am not able to. So. Um, I'd like to speak about uh, digital assets and sovereignty, and this is picking up on where Catherine is. And I'm going to take my five minutes um, to just talk about the new United States approach to fostering uh, responsible innovation in digital assets for the provision of financial services. And that has implications for money and payments, the efficiency of the payment system. It has implications for national security and other um, social values, democratic values, and it has implications for economic growth and financial stability. So let me just start with uh, digital assets, as you know, are a new form of uh, provision of financial services. It's not fundamentally different from f 
financial services that are provided in other ways, except that the ownership is recorded on a new technology using a distributed ledger technology. As you, also, as you know, the market value of this asset has grown tremendously since the pandemic. Um, it grew from about 200 million in the beginning of 2020 up to 3 trillion in November 2021. Uh, before central banks began to start to address inflation and is now a bit under $1 trillion. So it has, has grown rapidly and has been quite volatile. For the most part, digital assets are high risk, high return um, products of which many have questionable value, I would say. Now they are subject to substantial investor protection, consumer protection, illicit finance risks. And I think the first order issue is for regulators to get these assets into compliance with current regulations. But there's a number of other issues related to uh, digital assets that could potentially provide many benefits to the current payment system the current infrastructure of the financial system, and also have them potential uh, implications for the role of money in society. And in particular, I'd like to point to stable coins. Um, many of you have probably heard about the stable coins that are algorithmic backed. They've gone from you know, 50 billion to a zero. But there is a number of stable coins um, that have gained traction over the years that are pegged to a currency and currently, the vast majority are pegged to the US dollar, but they're backed by a store of reserve assets. Now, there is questions about the, the value, the true value of this reserve assets, whether they really could uh, be redeemed, if you were to redeem a stable coin, could they be redeemed dollar for dollar? But in general, the remaining ones have a fair amount of reserve assets. But there are also operational risks. If they are to be used as payments in the real world, not just for crypto trading, um, you also want to be sure that their payment risks are um, sufficiently addressed. If you can redeem stablecoin instantaneous, 24-7, but the underlying, say, treasury securities or other securities that back them have settlement times that are are nowhere near 24-7 instantaneous. You absolutely have operations risk. This is also an issue for, uh, there is also an issue of big network effects with stable coins. Um, large commercial firms in the past have tried to issue them. They can use their existing databases. The network effects, you can scale up very, very quickly. That could lead to, over time, an alternative uh, money a form of money that competes with um, sovereign currency. And so there are concerns about the potential to create walled gardens with stable coin where money inside that is separate from money outside that. So there are all kinds of issues that are being raised. So those are some of the key issues. Um, I want to highlight a few things that the US has been doing in the recent months. Um, in March of this year, President Biden issued an executive order to look at asking for a government-wide approach to address the benefits and assess the risks of uh, digital assets for financial services. And there, the first paper is uh, money and payments, of which I just want to highlight that is a key issue. Clearly, payment systems are inefficient. There is a role for digitization to improve the value. Whether a central bank should issue a digital currency, however, would naturally require or want a more public good aspect. What is the market failure that the central bank would want to address by issuing a central bank digital currency? That's an issue. And then I'll just close with national security. Clearly. Um, Digital assets have raised questions about increasing use of illicit finance. Um, the pseudo anonymity is attractive 
to certain bad actors. I would say in general in the US, we have not found that digital assets were widely or increasingly used in a big way to evade the sanctions from Russia. Um, digital assets can be used, so can cash. Cash is used widely. It is the most anonymous form of money, so I don't think that is um, the main issue, but um, ensuring that there's not regulatory arbitrage, ensuring consistent uh, regulation and supervision for illicit finance is key. Um, so I will leave it there um, for now and happy to take questions. Thank you very much for your time. Merci. Thank you. So if uh, technology works, uh, now listen to Klaus, uh, Klaus Regling. You see, there is uh, some concern about the Eurozone uh, uh, with this fragmentation. In the Euro, will the Euro, in these conditions, be able to reinforce its role internationally? And uh, can we hope to see an improvement of the union for the equity markets? Yes, good morning. Um, thanks for inviting me. I regret not being with you, which is obviously a big mistake. But I hope technology works and you can hear me well. Um, so you asked me to talk about the international role of the euro. And let me start with a broader view. Um, the world economy the international monetary system has relied on the US dollar as its dominant currency for about a century. During the first decades after World War II, this dominant role of the dollar helped the world economy to recover from the World War II, um, to integrate more, and to globalize. And this raised standards of living in everywhere and brought hundreds of millions of people in developing countries out of poverty. But the dominant role of the dollar also brought problems and risks. Actions by the Federal Reserve have ripple effects throughout the world economy, particularly in emerging markets that often have debt denominated in dollar. The Latin American debt crisis in the 80s and the Asian debt crisis in the late 90s had a lot to do with that dominant role of the dollar. In addition, that dominant role of the dollar makes it easier for US authorities to impose extra territorial sanctions that Catherine also mentioned in her introduction. But the world is changing. We have seen a trend towards deglobalization, or at least no further globalization, for some time. Trade has not been growing faster than world GDP for the last decade or two. Um, it was very different before that. Supply problems during the pandemic triggered reshoring in certain critical industries. And the international monetary system is moving slowly towards a multipolar monetary system. The war in Ukraine is likely to accelerate that trend towards deglobalization, towards a less integrated world. The world order seems to be reorganizing itself in three blocks or three groups of countries, where a new non-aligned group of countries comprises more than half the world population. In this respect, it's often overlooked in Europe that China is actively promoting the international role of the renminbi. And I think we really have to be aware and um, have answers to that. China's trade with neighboring countries in Asia is increasingly denominated in renminbi. And the renminbi is actually overtaking the Japanese yen as the world's third important currency in certain areas already. What does all that mean for the international role of the euro? Since its creation, the euro has clearly been the number one in the international monetary system, clearly with a big difference behind the dollar. In certain areas, 
the distance between the dollar and the euro is shrinking, like when we look at the share of foreign exchange reserves of central banks. For trade invoicing, another way to look at and measure the international role of currencies, the dollar is used even less now. The euro has overtaken the dollar in that area of trade invoicing. But in other areas, particularly in international finance, the dollar um, is used much more than the euro so far, including in equity markets and corporate debt. The potential for the euro to assume a larger role in the international monetary system is there. As the euro is backed by the largest single market in the world, a credible legal system, a highly open economy, and an independent central bank. Importantly, more than 60 countries outside the European Union have linked their currencies to the euro one way or another. The question is then, what needs to be done to support the international role of the euro to strengthen it? The agenda for that, I think, is quite clear. Um, European bodies work on that regularly. The European Commission, um, the Eurogroup, ECOFIN Council, ECB, um, and it also has something to do with what Catherine mentioned, fragmentation of the euro area. Everything that helps to integrate the euro area more, to make it work better, to promote convergence will also help the international role of the euro. And therefore, it's necessary to think about completing the banking union, creating an integrated capital markets union, um, have additional fiscal instruments for macroeconomic stabilization. Um, all that would help, on the one hand, to strengthen the European economy, raise the growth potential of the euro area, but it would also make the euro more attractive for international investors. So it would attract more capital. Um, also, what uh, Nettie just talked about for the US, um, the ECB is also working on a digital euro. And Nelly mentioned all the reasons why that can be good, but also what are the risks that uh, must be um, dealt with in order to make it effective. That's also true for the digital euro, and the work is ongoing on that. On capital markets union, banking union, progress is slow, but we have seen some over the last few years, and I'm confident that there will be more, but these will be crucial points um, for the international role of the euro. At the moment, for example, when an investor in Asia, let's say, wants to deal with all 19 euro area countries, that investor would need to recruit 19 lawyers from the different countries and regulatory experts, because there is not one integrated capital markets union. So creating mm -hmm. that would really help to strengthen the international role of the euro. Let me conclude. Strengthening the international role of the euro would be good for Europe in many respects, including a stronger European sovereignty. A multipolar currency system would also be good for the international monetary system, as it would reduce vulnerabilities. Europe can do it, and Europe should move in this direction as the world order is changing. Without stronger European integration and a stronger role for the euro, Europe will soon be squeezed between two global superpowers and can become insignificant. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Klaus. So, there are risks, and Capital Markets Union should make headway. Delphine Brassac, this fermentation of stock exchanges in Europe, uh, if we uh, 
uh, understood correctly, is a hindrance to uh, moving towards capital markets union. How does a financial institution such as yours manage that situation? Well, we talked about sovereignty uh, with uh, regards to risks of privatization of uh, currency. We talked of the euro versus dollar. I'll come back to uh, actually stock markets and why it is important to have European capital markets that actually work smoothly and uh, mitigate fragmentation, which is what um, industrial um, um, operators such as Euronext strive to do. Uh, they're uh, trying to work towards a federation but uh, um, uh, and look at uh, European regulation. Why does it matter first? Well, there are two very simple uh, and straightforward reasons. Ca companies need to find capital. They need to f uh, market conditions uh, make capital markets that we call uh, public markets in our jargon that is regulated uh, uh, markets even more important because money is more uh, uh, expensive. Uh, and financing will be more costly, bond financing uh, also, and private equity that was largely financed by free uh, money uh, uh, now has uh, conditions that are trickier. So stock markets uh, uh, are all the more important, which is why uh, in our pipeline we have so uh, m many uh, uh, applications. And, um, so what market uh, should be used? Uh, we uh, shouldn't uh, go against the grain and look for a, an integrated market elsewhere for good or bad reasons. If it's all good reasons, that's all well and good. But if it's bad reasons, uh, we should try and avoid it. The other part of the equation that we often disregard is that having part of um, a, a deep markets is good for uh, uh, savings. Uh, so for reasons, uh, for historical reasons, cultural reasons, local reasons, uh, people uh, avoid uh, certain options uh, because they are faced with narrow markets that are not very attractive. And it's, at the end of the day, it's uh, more complicated for them to go uh, invest on a European market that is neighboring rather than stay on the domestic market or to look at the American market, which is uh, unified. So the risk you see, and that's what we observe, is that uh, uh, European uh, uh, savers uh, do not look at the stock market, which is really a lose-lose situation. What is the approach that Europe has taken up until now? Well, the EU faces a natural and historical fragmentation of stock uh, uh, markets. Uh, they were, you know, they were created in their uh, specific uh, countries. And Catherine, uh, you mentioned DDCC, uh, that is. Uh, the uh, clearing uh, um, uh, body uh, created in the US uh, that uh, was actually initiated by uh, uh, the state. Uh, it is a unique market infrastructure in the US. So once you have that unified market infrastructure, uh, what's on top of that can be fragmented, doesn't matter, uh, because you'll have this, the, the same sort of uh, rule in, uh, rules in terms of cash contraction and transfer of securities. So that's something that we don't have in Europe. Um, it is uh, complicated in terms of depository. Some have been unified by Euroclear, but only partially, and securities rights are uh, uh, local. So it is uh, complicated to make for more unification. Um, the ECB had come up with the T2S uh, uh, initiation, but didn't pull through. Um, and renationalizing infrastructures is not the trend that Europe is uh, entertaining, and that's not something we should wish for. What has the EU done? Well, they've uh, uh, they've uh, tried to encourage competition by opening um, the competition on uh, trade. Uh, and promoting a vision that was uh, already uh, uh, in, in the US and that was pushed by our uh, British friends that were still in the EU, opening um, multilateral platforms uh, and even dark trading. That is to say, the possibility for major banking players, stakeholders, to internationalize orders 
uh, beyond the uh, uh, transparent uh, uh, stock market. But the impact was that it's fragilized uh, primary markets. It's given, it's given some keys to uh, people who can aggregate uh, 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 on top of markets and find, and find themselves to be, uh, same as um, always, uh, major uh, North American stakeholders. We like them. They're very efficient. But suffice it to say that these players are non-European uh, for uh, most of them. And the question we uh, put forward at Euronext is why do we not try to work towards more consolidation and the conversation is hard to have of a unique single supervision because in Europe we've done quite a, a lot of things we have a shared regulation but they're not necessarily implemented and they're not uh, uh, um, uh, used by regulators uh, uh, in a unified uh, way we do not have that single unified supervision in the EU states are very reluctant actually what we have currently is um, uh, entities such as us, Euronext, uh, a stock market with one technology, and we actually try to make a contribution, but it's only a, a, a humble contribution, to uh, for um, our clients who uh, work on the market to uh, make things simpler. So if you want to come, uh, if you're in Paris and you want to act on uh, the Oslo market, you need only take one extra box and you will be put in that uh, pool. And it's our job to harmonize several um, uh, reg uh, regulators or regulations. But this effort is put in um, almost exclusively by private uh, uh, players. So the EU uh, should ask itself, uh, should they not do the job, do the work on supervision so that we can move forward? Thank you very much, Delphine. Well, make complex things simple. That doesn't seem to be easy. But, yeah. Uh, it requires full expertise. So let's listen to representative for uh, the um, banking sector. So uh, Kirsten Rasmussen, uh, you are the head of a Norwegian bank. You are not part of the EU, but you s a European country nonetheless. Would you say that it makes a difference in terms of strategy? Uh, in terms of banking strategy, uh, do you sometimes regret you're not in the EU, or does it give you extra flexibility to um, uh, reach certain aims in terms of development and technology? Well, thank you very much for this uh, uh, question. It's very broad, but I'll, I'll try and comment on it. And thank you for this opportunity to uh, be part of this panel discussion. I totally agree with uh, Ms. Damarzit on the importance of uh, financial in, uh, infrastructure and f um, financial uh, institution and capital markets. Uh, and even though I'd love to uh, be able to uh, speak French, uh, it's been too long since I spoke French, so I'll shift to English for my reflection. An institution in the Nordics, uh, I would like to reflect on a couple of key areas that uh, I believe supports the uh, fact of having a, a strong and uh, viable financial sector in supporting economic growth and development uh, of uh, markets. Uh, the first one uh, uh, is describing the fact that the Nordics actually have some of uh, the most robust and profitable banks in Europe. We have, like Europe, built a lot of capital, uh, but there is a difference on the profitability aspect. Uh, and although I wouldn't say that the regulators have prioritized profitability, I think there's been an understanding of the importance of the profitability of the sector. What has enabled profitability? One of the key points that I would uh, like to highlight is allowing a substantial change. There's been a huge restructuring uh, of uh, reducing num number of branches, uh, increasing efficiency. And what has this enabled? Well, it has enabled supporting the economy with capital to the corporates, but also a substantial amount of uh, innovation and investment, not only for regulatory compliance, but for example, in critical payments infrastructure. Uh, furthermore, 
there is a strong cooperation across the industry. Uh, and this has also enabled the banks to keep a very high level of trust. So capital we've been seeing built across all of Europe, which is extremely important. Uh, uh, but there has been changes in the competitive environment. And I'd like to share one example, because in addition to being a bank, we are also a client of many of the European and American banks. We go to the market to fund billions every year to support our uh, customers. Uh, there has not only been an increasing presence of US uh, banks in Europe in the investment banking market, but also a substantial reduction of European banks being active in the, uh, in the US market. So competition is less. If we take a look at this from a market value uh, perspective, if we go 20 years back, the 25 largest European banks, they matched the value of the 25 largest US banks. Uh, today, you take the two largest U.S. banks, and they are worth more than the 14 largest European banks altogether. As a client, and also for the European economy, we would welcome to see a broader uh, and more well-functioning uh, competition. The second uh, reflection I would like to make is on digitization and the importance in the role of the finance to drive modernization and digitization to support economic uh, growth. I'm fortunate to live in one of the most sort of advanced digit or mature digital countries uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, we actually don't have cash, practically. 3% of the transactions in Norway are settled by cash. And my thing, I think my children, they probably see cash twice a year. This is a substantial increase in efficiency. This efficiency is being used to invest into the uh, payments infrastructure, to develop new and better services to customers. And Catherine mentioned uh, VIPS, uh, which is a digital wallet. It's used by everyone in Norway. We have a digital ID that has been used for years. It's used 18, times every, 18 million times every week. We are 5 million people. It's not only used for your banking services, it's also used for your tax declaration, for your doctor's appointment, for all of your public services uh, needs. Uh, and this leads me to, to uh, a very important point in the digitization uh, trend, and that has been the cooperation between the public and the private sector. The public sector has been a huge driver of change and behavior. We also have people who are not digital, and we have to serve them well. But the main trend is not to have a double infrastructure. And I would say and highlight that there is important work being done on digital central bank money, like uh, uh, my colleague here on the panel talked about. But it's possible also and important to digitize the current uh, infrastructure. My Final point would be on the importance of finance to solve one of our greatest challenges, and that is the climate. Uh, mobilizing capital, enabling transparency is a very important trend to move and continue to move uh, faster. The amount of capital being raised in the Nordics into green investments has increased from being 5% of all of the bond emissions five years ago to now 20%. Uh, percent. Uh, there's a huge reallocation of capital going on. And we have set very specific targets, not only to support the new investments, but also to uh, help the transition. Because it's a transition we need. We don't need to completely shut the door and, and only, look at, uh, uh, only look at the new uh, investments. Is it going fast enough? Definitely not. Uh, but the uh, clients and the corporates that we listen to, they actually ask for more regulation. They want a level playing field so that we can avoid having what is today felt by many as being a first mover disadvantage instead of a first mover advantage. Thank you. I'll close my comments there. Donc, Monsieur Philippe Brassac. Mr. Philippe Brassac, representing Crédit Agricole, a uh, French bank, so uh, retail bank, uh, very French-based, uh, but a very international investment uh, bank uh, activity, first access uh, manager with Amundi in Europe. Um, you consider, if I understood correctly, that the uh, 
influence of North America also uh, go, uh, translates through regulation. How is it a hindrance uh, in the pursuit of your uh, activity to finance a uh, real uh, uh, economy, uh, same as everybody should? Uh, uh, well, uh, Kristen, uh, that was a very good idea to start in French. Well, um, we never define what we mean by sovereignty. Sovereignty is not about autonomy and mm, let alone isolation. Let's understand it as the objective to keep the capacity to determine options or specificities that are uh, uh, adapted to uh, yourself because you consider that on certain points the specificities or options that others have uh, 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 chosen in the rest of the world do not apply or are not the best for you. And if we think of the financial crisis in 2008, it was decided um, uh, to harmonize uh, international regulation and mechanically it goes without saying that harmonizing uh, uh, international rules kind of uh, irons out or smooth and smooth out uh, uh, specificities and uh, does have an impact on the capacity to sovereignty. We know that the rules of the game determine how the game goes. You think of any board game. Um, uh, you have to know all the rules, but we do not factor in sufficiently this uh, almost direct influence of the rules uh, of the game on the game itself. Let me give you an illustration. There's uh, one thing that is very well known but never analyzed. What is notorious is that the American market and the US, the economy finances itself through markets a lot more than uh, bank uh, banks. Uh, and in Europe, it's the opposite. Uh, more through credits and uh, balance sheets and banks than markets. So we've never wondered uh, why there was this uh, uh, difference. Is it a cultural uh, difference? Well, there are several explanations for that. In Europe, we chose, well, it was more or less a choice, pension funds that are based on distribution, redistribution, not based on capitalization. So we have very few volumes of pension funds that are uh, extremely large in the US, and that's bad news because regardless of what we do, capital markets will be a lot less deep than it is in the US. With, it, with capital markets that are uh, uh, not as deep, even though we can enhance its efficiency, what does it entail? Well, uh, for uh, good reasons, uh, international regulation, regulators say that for uh, uh, banks balance sheets we are uh, 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 that are way lighter and uh, full of credits uh, in, uh, in in the EU and necessities of uh, uh, liquidity need in terms of uh, leveraging uh, and we don't have that option uh, to uh, tap into uh, capital markets that uh, exist in the US. So there are historical reasons that determine the way the economy works. And we cannot um, uh, reduce it to matters of regulation or technical uh, uh, reasons. There's some th another example that will speak to more uh, of you uh, is mortgages. Uh, so uh, of course, in the south of France, there's a lot of mortgages. Uh, it's half of the balance sheet of banks is uh, uh, actually uh, made up of mortgages. Uh, and it, there's a cultural uh, uh, reason for that. We consider that um, uh, in English-speaking countries, finance is more about transactions. So you cut a deal, and then uh, you um, uh, it's amicable, and that's the end of it. That's the end of the transaction. Uh, in France, uh, and uh, we have a European model that is more uh, relation-based. It's not about being, uh, you know, uh, more, uh, you know, friendlier with people. It's about something that is a longer process unfolding over time. And with mortgages over a 20 or 25-year period, there will be events uh, during which you'll stay in touch with the uh, with your uh, uh, customer. And uh, quite often, uh, there are cases of divorces that are uh, the most recurrent events. It's about uh, assuming a responsibility over time um, with uh, uh, the way we uh, serve our customers. And that has given rise to two types of uh, credits. So 
mortgages that are on fixed rates in France during 15 uh, years. We keep it in our balance sheet, which means that we keep the relationship and the responsibility during 20 and 25 years throughout the life cycle of that credit. And then we grant these uh, mortgages based on the capacity uh, of customers to pay back based on their income. The US model, the American mortgage that, yeah, and I'm not criticizing, it's just different. Uh, it's to authorize, uh, if it's good, you securitize it, you break the relationship with uh, the bank and you estimate uh, uh, it uh, uh, on the basis of the security that is given, so the, the guarantee, uh, hence mortgage. Those are two types of credits that are completely different. And we estimate that 20 years ago, with regulations that were more and more uh, pregnant with uh, Basel II, there was a trend to factor in that specificity. Those were called internal models. Internal models were about the capacity for banks under the authority of supervisors to factor in their specificities uh, regional or local specificities, the way they estimated risk. Uh, in Basel IV, which is the finalization of Basel III, uh, we're coming back to an estimation of risk or assessment of risk uh, based on, a world, on world standards that would not call North American, but statistically uh, it's uh, um, highly influenced by the way uh, North America sees risks. I'm not saying this is uh, uh, a bad thing in itself. But I think uh, uh, there's a lack of political uh, uh, approach to that. I don't think that Basel IV is the only reason why we do not have more credits in France. But conversely, I think that by 2032, when that regulation, once that regulation will be fully implemented, behaviors on the part of customers and bankers will have adapted to those new game rules. And that will go from these fixed rate uh, um, credits to more flexible credits that can be revised dependent on um, security and, and, and guarantee. But what really is a major problem and a major issue uh, to me is that uh, there's no political analysis. There's no political will. Let's look at participatory uh, 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 credit. That does not exist in the in the US because it's almost uh, um, uh, akin to uh, shareholders' equity. Uh, Basel III uh, actually put a lot of um, uh, taxes and constraints on these participatory credits. Uh, well, uh, and this, uh, so uh, when, uh, and when uh, states uh, wanted to uh, uh, relaunch these kind of, uh, of uh, uh, loans uh, that were uh, more akin to crowdfunding, uh, they didn't follow through. Uh, well, you said, uh, isn't it too technical? I don't understand that argument because everything's technical in the end. You know, uh, in uh, the industrial world, everything's technical. Uh, the chemistry behind a diesel um, uh, engine uh, is very technical. It's no reason why um, there shouldn't be any political will or uh, 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 or political vision. The absence of any political vision is a major issue to me. Indeed. So you uh, used a few words about crowdfunding. Uh, that makes for a perfect segue. Uh, to what I wanted to uh, uh, tell, uh, talk about next. We often said that finance should be uh, really serving real economy. Now we're talking about finance serving um, economic sovereignty. Um, so where are we at? Uh, promises of deregulating, have they uh, been uh, actually uh, realized or not? Thank you, Catherine, and um, really enjoyed um, all the speakers. I actually want to pick up uh, uh, particularly on the point that uh, the previous speaker, Philippe, um, made uh, about this inherent tension uh, between uh, the urge on the one hand to uh, integrate financially and deepen financial markets um, and on the other hand, uh, the desire for specificity that that different 
countries or different regions have different banking systems or different rules or different preferences. And that's an inherent tension um, that one has to manage. Now, it seems to me that during the last um, three or four decades, um, we have resolved this tension overwhelmingly in the direction of letting um, financial integration and financial deepening and financial globalization go. So we have made our choices overwhelmingly in the direction of uh, common standards, common regulations, and homogenization of rules. Um, and that necessarily narrows uh, the room for individual governments or individual regions, along some of the examples that Philippe gave, of making their own choices uh, with respect to, for example, you know, at the very basic level uh, with regard to where do you want to pick the trade-off between financial stability on the one hand, financial innovation on the other. Uh, the looser the regulations, the more financial innovation you will have, but the more likely that you will in increase financial volatility. That seems to me to be, and again, using Philippe's words, inherently a political trade-off. It's a choice politically as to where you want to be on that trade-off. Um, now, it wasn't crazy, I think, that, you know, that we went down this way because there was a very strong narrative uh, about how financial deregulation, financial liberalization, uh, financial integration, financial globalization uh, was going to make the world a better place. Um, and I think that was that narrative is what pushed us down that way. And I think the narrative was that through deeper financial markets that we would be able to increase savings and investment, mobilize resources that would increase growth that we would be better able to allocate risks, uh, move risks to, to, from those who did not want to bear it to those who welcomed it, um, that internationally we would be moving resources from richer countries to poorer countries, allow for uh, um, uh, better smoothing of uh, consumption, both at the household level as well as at the national level. So these were all very strong and theoretically plausible arguments about how um, deeper financial markets and, and more extensive financial globalization would work. Well, four years later, we can work back and, and pretty much the evidence is in that most of these predictions have not been borne out. We have not had increased investment. Um, we have not had increased growth. Um, capital has flowed in the you know, term of economists uphill. That is, it's gone from poor countries to rich countries. Uh, financial volatility, financial crises have increased, and these have produced not just economic uh, consequences, they have also produced broader social and political consequences. Financial liberalization has produced greater economic inequality. That is research from the International Monetary Fund, so you can sort of believe that. Um, we also have more recent research shows that, that some of the uprise in uh, in populism, the far-right populism, um, can be traced uh, to the effects of the financial crisis um, of um, the, um, the late 2000s. Um, so this is, I think, where we are. And I think we need to reconsider how we can make finance less of a sovereign entity on its own, but how we can actually make finance serve the needs of society. So that finance needs to serve the needs of society. Um, and that, I think, rethinking and consideration has, is only really beginning. So I don't have magic bullets or you know, uh, very interesting ideas to offer to you. But let me at least, in the last minute, just suggest you know, three different areas where we need to make much more progress. One is the role of finance in, um, in, in facilitating and financing innovation. Now, we all know about venture capital. Venture capital is fantastic at uh, funding innovation, but it's a tiny, tiny part of the entire financial system, even in the United States, where it plays a, a, an oversized role by many measures. It's actually less than 1% of the financial system, but that's really what you know, finance can really do. Venture capital can be really powerful. How can we expand that? Uh, secondly, finance has a tremendous role in accelerating structural transformation, especially the green transition. So um, Kirsten talked about that. That's an incredibly important role for redirecting finance in that. Third and finally, I would say that, um, that despite financial deepening, 
there are large segments of the economy that still are basically cannot borrow adequately, in particular smaller and medium-sized enterprises that tend to be borrowing constrained. So there's a hu huge role for long-term lending for smaller and medium-sized enterprises uh, that, that needs to take place, and that would also require thinking. So just to conclude, I think we're at a point where it's like so many things that are being considered, uh, Klaus Regling mentioned uh, what's happening in terms of globalization, but the whole economic paradigm again, within which we work is being changed, and I think finance is going to be part of that reconsideration, and that is a conversation that we need to have. Thank you. Merci pour cette... Thank you very much for this uh, conclusion. Uh, well, that was perfect, so no need for another conclusion. Bearing in mind that time flies, I will just w say one quick word by way of conclusion. Finance, suffice it to say, is a double-edged sword because it can be uh, an arm of massive destruction uh, of GDP, as we saw in the crisis, but also a powerful economic weapon. So I think we need to have better command of it and better redirect it. Thank you very much.